Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Welcome to Asia Tech Podcast number 17. We're talking about autonomous vehicles. So Asia is set to become a market leader in the world of autonomous vehicles. In the first part of this Asia Tech podcast series, we're going to talk about and discuss the headline statistics and what's driving the market. Asia Tech Podcast, voice of the Asian tech ecosystem. I was I was talking to somebody over the weekend, right? And you know, I've got a hundred different things that I can talk about every week with you because there's so much stuff going on and. The person to whom I was speaking was an engineer. He's an industrial engineer, and he's, he actually guest teaches as a professor. And he asked me what I did and what types of things interested me. And we started talking about technology and venture capital and investing. And the first thing he said to me was, what do you think about autonomous cars? Mm. And I literally said to him before I even thought about the discussion you and I were going to have was, how much time do you have? Because I've got such well-developed thoughts on this, and it's been something that's been so interesting to me since I first started hearing about it. And I think this is something people think about, you know, I started driving when I was 16 years old, so that's a long time ago. And every time I stepped into a car, I thought, if I could be doing something else, and the car could just be driving itself. And then, of course, we had cruise control. Right. right? And, and I remember one summer, this is a long time ago, one of my father's colleagues was going on vacation and wanted my dad to like watch his car for the summer. And I had been at summer camp and when I was, you know, when I was at summer camp, my dad sent an email and said, we're going to have a new car for the summer. And let me tell you what it does. First of all, it does its speed on its own. It automatically controls the climate inside the car. So if it gets too hot, it increases the air conditioning. If it gets too cold, it increases the temperature. You know, went through all these little, if the, if the sound in the car is too high, it turns up the rate. All these things that seemed so futuristic in what we say, you know, like the Jetsons. <laughs> and it was just like a Cadillac Eldorado, but it had all this tech built into it. And let me tell you, this was not like 1990. This was in the 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it was the early 80s, but I doubt it because I was too young. I probably wasn't even driving yet. And I even remember the color of this thing. But... I remember getting in. The, I didn't believe any of the, the stuff that I'd heard. Did not believe it was possible that a car could do all that stuff. And yet it could. And that's when I first started thinking about, okay, when will this thing start driving? Why not? When will it start driving itself? You know, of course, flying, but that's a different subject altogether. But this concept of putting all this technology into a car mm. is just amazing as far as I'm concerned. Well, we've been a bit burnt, haven't we? I mean, you go back to the Jetsons. If you look at those sort of magazines from the 50s, that promised us flying cars, you know, that would have been around, well, at the turn of the millennium, right? That's what we were promised. So I think people were a little bit wary that we we're going to have this kind of sci-fi future for cars, right? But it's kind of coming through the back door, really, and it's made its own progress without the kind of the media hype, hasn't it? It, it has. And it's funny because when I was going through the thought process of actually thinking about this episode, I thought, okay, what types of things will be impacted by an autonomous car? Or really what I like to call ground vehicles, right? Because I think it's buses, yeah. taxis, any kind of vehicle trucks. that has four wheels or trucks or anything, even two wheelers, right? Three wheelers for sure. And I started thinking about different shapes and sizes and what the impact would be. And I really, you know, I started making a list. You know, is it shopping, parking, earning money, dining out? And I realized, you know what? It's just going to impact your day-to-day -day life and every Everything. aspect of it. It really is, though. In the same way that, you know, your mobile phone has really transformed the way your life works, hmm. I think um, autonomous ground vehicles will definitely do the same thing. And we haven't even spoken about, you know, autonomous airborne vehicles. But again, that's, you know, a few weeks ahead. Hmm. Let's let's just let's just talk about this. I mean, I believe that this is going to happen in Asia first, which is one of the reasons why we're talking about about this. You, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, let's just have a look at the top headline stats on that, and then we can look at why we think it's Asia first. There's, there's a whole bunch of data coming out at the moment, and just let's sort of review some of that. Ford did their own research, so obviously they you know they don't have a vested interest in putting Asia out there as a world leader, but they found that 84% of Indians and 78% of Chinese saw themselves as owning an autonomous car 
compared with only 40% of Americans and 30% of Britons. So that was kind right. of and why is It's amazing, right? And why is that? I mean, we talk in the United States a lot, but I think for the UK, it's the same thing. There's a car culture. Yeah. Right? And that car culture, I remember, again, when I was in high school, you know, some of my friends on the weekend would literally spend all day with their car, just messing right. around with fixing the engine, enhancing the tires, detailing, car detail in the United States oh, is yeah. a big deal, right? Um, well, it's a rite of passage, up, isn't it? For I mean, completely. I, I think of those movies like, what is it, American Graffiti. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that, that for me sums up the car. You know, it's not just, it's not about, you know, necessarily getting from A to B. It's It's so much more than that. It's mobility, it's freedom, and all those kind of things it meant for you know, those generations after the war. Sure. Sure, completely. And, you know, the all the building of the highway systems and the road systems and the connectivity between cities, a lot of that stuff actually takes place now technologically. And because, again, maybe in the same way that Asia leapfrogged sort of the desktop PC and laptop right. revolution and went directly to mobile, I think the same thing's going to happen with let's just call it the millennial generation and their desire maybe not to own a car. It's just mm. sunk money. You know, I was looking around for statistics and I think the best one I could find was that most cars are parked like 95% of the time. Right. It's a lot of waste, right. isn't it? It's a ton of waste and particularly in, you know, traffic congested and traffic challenged cities. And I think because the growth in Asia has been so rapid and a lot of that growth has meant – people moving and migrating from the countryside into the bigger cities. So a city that was maybe a population of 2 million 15 years ago is now 12 million people. Right. And people still stream into these cities um, in cars. I think what it means is that <clears throat> the, the likelihood that they're going to have to fix these problems just to make the cities themselves livable and workable from an economic standpoint, we can talk a lot about that, yeah. is going to have to be sort of top of the line for solving what some of the problems are. In some of these cities, I think just to get back to some of the statistics you were talking about, you know, Asia is already the the leader in car sharing, right? Two point mm. three million people in Asia, two point one million people in Europe, only one point nine million people in the United States. That's as of the most recent data that that we've seen as of two thousand and fifteen. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you you would assume America would have led because of Uber and Lyft and et cetera, right? Right. So I guess the question really is. Autonomous driving or autonomous vehicles, why? Is this just sort of a toy for the rich or just some way for people to show off, you know, like, look, ma, no hands, I'm, my car is moving and I'm not going? Right. Or is this really addressing an issue that needs to get resolved? And I think the answer is it's solving a whole bunch of issues. Yeah. Well, we've reached breaking point. You, I know you mentioned about just for a city to remain economically functional. I mean, go to Jakarta you know have you ever tried to get around that city in like rush hour i mean there isn't rush hour it's like you know people get stuck in their cars for three hours four hours at a time i know people who abandon their cars in jakarta just leave their yeah. cars and get up and walk home right i mean the traffic congestion is just one aspect of this right and i remember five or six years ago when i was deciding to move to bangkok one of my friends who had lived here earlier and this was Pre-BTS, but even post-BTS, I don't think – I think population growth has kind of taken care of all the positive benefits from a traffic and congestion standpoint that the BTS has had. And for those of you listening that don't know what the BTS is, this is an elevated train, so it's like a subway above ground. Um, and it's done a great job of actually creating mobility in the city, but not such a great job of helping the traffic and congestion because as the city gets richer, people buy more cars, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the government – because cars are manufactured in Thailand – Right. We talk, we've talked about this before in a different context, but Thailand is the second largest manufacturer of Japanese cars outside of Japan, with the first being the U.S. It's amazing. You wouldn't think it. Think about that. So the Mitsubishi Pajero that I own was actually made in Thailand. And Toyota, Mazda, Isuzu, all these companies, and Honda, all these companies make cars here. So the government obviously gives incentive for people to buy new cars. Um, but let's just talk about, so there's traffic, and one of the downsides of traffic is pollution as mm. well, right? Now, Bangkok turns out to be not such a polluted city. But again, let's get back to this concept of how, how the traffic impacts the economy. Before, I, as I was mentioning earlier, before I moved here, one of my friends who had lived here had said to me, if you're going to drive around to do your errands, you should really only plan on doing two things every day. 
And the reason why was because you just get stuck in traffic. Yeah. And the city was not, you know, built with cars in mind and the roads were not optimized for it. It also meant that parking was a real problem, right? And in some of these sort of modernizing Asian cities, you still have a concept of having a driver. So a lot of the cars double park on the street as well because the driver is waiting outside wherever the, their, um, the owner of the car is potentially shopping. Hmm. Yeah. But also let's talk a little bit about, and we, I want to come back to each one of these topics, but I want to introduce them a little bit as well. If we don't get to cover them in this episode, I think there's plenty of time to cover them in the next episode. But safety is also a really important concept, right? And the question is, does everybody who's driving actually have a driver's license? Does everybody know how to drive? Have people been educated about driving etiquette? Or are they just taking a quick driving test and then moving onto the road and then kind of figuring out driving etiquette as they go along? I think you'll find that safety and automobile accidents are higher in developing cities. And I think it's no different in Asia than it was, frankly, in the West, and I'll use New York as an example, you know, back in the teens and 20s and 30s, before kind of all the road regulations were sort of strictly adhered to. Hmm. And I think we're just seeing the same thing repeat itself here. And I do say that often, that I don't think these are issues that are necessarily unique to Asia, but I think they're unique today because those issues, particularly from safety, has been resolved in other countries because they just have a much longer driving history. What do you think of this McKinsey data? Michael, that suggests that when we reach full autonomy, which they call level five, which is basically where a car can drive itself without a human being inside, that they can reduce crashes by 90%. I mean, what do you think of that kind of data? Are you bullish on that? Completely. I, I mean, most airplanes today completely fly themselves. Now, I know airplanes don't have to deal with traffic, but they have a lot of other non-trivial things with which they have to deal but if I had said to you, if I say to you today, Graham, let's go get into a car. It's going to drive itself. Let's go out to dinner and the car will drive us home. You'd say, that's insane. I'm not getting into something that's driving itself. I could die. But if I say to you, let's get on a plane and go to, and I'll meet you in Taipei, mm. that A380 or that A320 or the 777 or the 787 Dreamliner, Dreamliner is essentially flying itself as soon as it gets off the ground. And I would make the case that landing, which is the trickiest thing that a plane does, except for flying in weather and taking off are almost all automated as well. So if you can do that, I've always thought that cars, trains, buses, all these things can also be automated. And the significance of reducing crashes by 90%, my guess is that <clears throat> a number higher than 90 can account for, humans can account for almost all accidents. Yeah. That's why we call them accidents. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. And I think it's because people are speeding People are not paying attention. Today, it's worse than ever because even before cell phones, people were reading newspapers or e eating or talking to their passengers or switching the radio. But now, Smoking. They're, yeah. but now they're texting each other and photographing each other and video talking. It's yeah. just insane. What's going on inside a car right now is insane. And I think it could actually save so much in healthcare. But then – you know, do we even address the concept of what it does to insurance? In other yeah, words, yeah. if the likelihood of an accident is going to be so low, then what happens to the insurance industry or the auto insurance industry writ large? Like, what happens? Right. I would have thought if you have an autonomous car, you're going to get the, the minimum possible insurance, right? Because if you trust the process and you trust the machine – then it's going to look after you and you're less likely to get an accident. You're less likely to feel compelled to get full cover for your insurance, right? Sure. If you have level five automation and you can pretty much prove via technology that an accident that occurred was not your fault and that the other driver either had level three or below or was simply a human driving that car, your insurance could revert to zero. Right. And that other person's insurance actually in reverse will go higher. So it's almost like for lack of a better term, it's like that other driver has an existing condition and you are perfectly healthy. And what that means is that they're going to subsidize your lack of insurance because they're much more risky to insure. And I think it's going to encourage people through at least that economic incentive mm. to as quickly as possible get, it to, get to a point where they have an automated driving car as high as close to level five as possible. I don't know the data, but I, 
I'm guessing here that the the real payouts in the insurance is not really anything to do with the the loss of the machine itself. It's the human beings involved, right? And I'd imagine with any kind of accident, you know, if somebody was to die, that's probably the least expensive outcome for an insurance company. The worst case is where, you know, you have somebody who needs, you know, long-term rehabilitation, right? The claims must be formidable, right? Uh, for sure. But, and I mean, imagine this situation, right? Imagine driving in a city where it's very congested, which means that, you know, being an efficient driver and being what we used to call a defensive driver is very hard to do. And let's say that the insurance system is set up that let's say you keep somebody away from their job for a week mm -hmm. and they are earning their keep by the hour or by some day to day metric. So let's imagine this situation. Imagine you're driving down the road, minding your own business, but you get a text and you're texting back to someone and you jam into a taxi cab that's privately owned. And if that taxi cab has to be off the road for five days or 10 days because they can't work because you've damaged their car, mm -hmm. that means now you owe them money for their employment as well. And there could be punitive damages depending on what legal system in, in which you exist. There are many ways where it could cost you way more money, as you said, than just the car itself. And then if that person is injured and they have to go to a hospital and then they have to be out of work longer, now you have to pay their hospital bills, their car getting replaced, and the fact that they can't work during the time period that they're yeah. disabled. So if everybody's driving an automated car, the likelihood – first of all, there's no road rage, right? <laughs> I wasn't driving, you're not driving, so how can I be mad at you? Yeah. It's unlikely, even in, even in a place like, if, have you been in the, the UAE recently? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can get upset with the taxi drivers there, but their cars monitor for the ca taxi company themselves how fast they're going. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a hurry, you can basically yell and scream at the taxi driver all you want, but he says, look, I'm being monitored. If I go above whatever the limit is that the taxi company sets, I'm going to get in trouble. Right, so imagine an, an AV5, right, an automated, ve an autonomous vehicle, level five, that has some of those things set in it. And then imagine, you know, arriving at a toll booth. No one's going to pay money anymore to toll booth, right? All, all of those functions are going to be automated as well and to speed up traffic, particularly on highways. Mm. I mean, the implications of this, just again, like you said, from a safety and economic standpoint, just in that little sector alone are going to be huge. But then the question is, what happens to all the people that earn their living in the auto insurance industry? Right. Right, because revenues there are going to drop precipitously, I think. Yeah. Well, it seems to be a market which has grown exponentially, isn't it? I mean, over the last few decades. What, insurance? Insurance, right? I mean, in terms <laughs> of, you know, from where it started out to where it is now, you know, I, 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 and you've got to ask what kind of value does it really add to the whole industry, right? I mean, it's just there because it's it's a hygiene factor, right? In driving a car, you've got to have it. It doesn't add any value beyond just, you know, the basic cover. Right. And I mean, we can talk about the regulations around the necessity for auto insurance, but you can't buy a car in the United States. And I don't think in Thailand as well without getting insurance on that car. Hmm. You're not illegally allowed to drive it without insurance. And part of that has to be because of lobbying by insurance companies to make sure that they can make a minimum amount of money off of every car that gets sold. I mean, you can see the way that you can see the loop there, right? Yeah. But right, so you, what happens, what happens when the cars are autonomous, then what do they do? Well, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, one of the big problems is for younger drivers and insurance. And usually is the case that younger drivers will get insured on their parents policy, right? Correct because they get insured as an extra driver or whatever it is, and then they can you know, build up some kind of history and then get their own. But if you're a young driver, going out and doing it yourself, the fees are punitive, right? I mean, it's, they're punishing, like the, the premiums that you pay for even the most basic of cars. So that's going to be really interesting because then, you know, that's a whole market which is effectively being priced out by the fact that they can't afford to insure their vehicles, right? Absolutely. And I think the other end of the spectrum is just as bad, if not worse. Let's say you've been driving since you're 18 years old and now you're 65 or 70. Or let's say you haven't been driving. So you have no driving record 
and your spouse dies or your you have to move to a place where you need a vehicle to get around, but you've never had insurance before, mm-hmm. and you buy your first car, again, not autonomous, when you're 65 years old. Yeah. Those premiums for your insurance are through the roof. But if it's an autonomous car, first of all, it's much safer because the car can see for you, the car can hear for you, the car's reflexes are better than yours. You just get into the car, go to the store, do your shopping if that's what you're doing, or go to visit your friends. Now, you can make the case that online shopping is going to take the place of regular shopping, but it's not going to replace going to see your friends yeah. a mile away or two kilometers away. It's not going to happen. And if you can get into a vehicle to do that, that's going to be really beneficial, and that requires sort of autonomous uh, vehicles to do that. So this stat that you brought up earlier, Michael, that the average car spends 95% of its time parked on your driveway or whatever it is, yes. right? or not, not being yes. driven. I think that's going to be interesting, is it? Because that stat is now going to become unavoidable for, I guess, a couple of reasons. On the one hand, you know, now there's this option that you don't need to have a car. We're starting to see this with car sharing, but you know, I guess the bottleneck in car sharing is the human being driver, right? You can, now you can eliminate that. Sure. But there's also this other one that people actually want cars, not just for their utility value, but for the status value, which is, you know, I've got a nice car, it's parked on the driveway, et cetera, et cetera, all that kind of stuff that goes with that. But that's kind of being eroded as well. Because we talked earlier about you know American graffiti, that whole sort of status going that associ- wrapped up in the car is being maybe offered by other things as well. Now people maybe don't see the car as the only thing that's the uh, you know badge of status. There are no, I mean, I mean, I was having dinner recently and I sat near somebody who's a jewelry designer, um, globally renowned actually, which I did not know before I started this conversation with them, and their whole point was that. The whole point of the conversation centered around the fact that people are no longer interested in using expensive brands to um, to get status. Mm-hmm. And I think cars are going to be the same way, right? In a way, having a really expensive car makes you look stupid, mm-hmm. right? So for people growing up today, like when I was a kid, I just – I wanted my own car. Like that was it because having my own car meant I could – have a girlfriend, I could go pick up my friends, I could do all these things that made me cooler than I really was if I could have my own car. And the kids that had a nicer car, you know, were showing off how wealthy their families were. The, there was a lot of status tied up in that car. But today, maybe that's in a cell phone, maybe it's in a tablet, mm-hmm. maybe it's in a laptop, maybe it's in some other piece of technology that it gives you the same freedom. I mean, how cool would it be if your son was standing with his friends and said, just give me a second, I'm going to hail a car, and boom, in three <laughs> minutes it showed up, they all got in, and they got to go around, and it cost them $4 or whatever it is, 400 yen or 500 yen in your neighborhood, and then they got out of the car, walked away, they never had to clean it, they never had to put gas in it, they never had to change the oil or do anything, and they never had insurance for that, so all that extra money that they have now is available yeah. for other things in the economy. That's amazing, and maybe that's cooler than saying, I've got a Chevy Camaro. Totally. Or whatever the cool car is. I don't know. That just dated myself from the 70s. But you know what I mean. <laughs> Collector's no item. Laughing, no laughing aloud, by the way. <laughs> well, then doesn't that raise the question is that, you know, will this whole autonomous vehicle market really just open the floodgates on ownership or alternatives to ownership? You know, that's going to be really interesting because – the examples that you give, like, for example, you know, if you're 65 and you wanted to go shopping or just go and see your friends, sorry, it doesn't matter. You know, what's the point of having a car on the driveway? Just hail a zero. cab, you're away. Yeah, zero. Exactly. So, that I mean, that's just, I don't know. You know, it's kind of interesting that these auto brands are leading the charge. But, you know, could it be their undoing long term? I think it really is going to be. So... You know, back in 2007, I don't know what the global number was for car sales, but I can look it up pretty quickly. But they're much higher than they are. They're much higher today than they were then. And first, there was a massive drop off after the global financial crisis. But now it, it increased quite a bit. But what I see happening here, right? So you don't it, it, let's say you live in Bangkok and you need to get to a train station in the morning. You take a motorcycle taxi. But let's say you don't live near a motorcycle stand. Just 10 minutes before you want to leave, you just order up a grab bike. Mm. And you're done. And that bike, that grab bike costs you 20 baht or 30 baht. It costs a dollar. And you can get to the station. It completely disintermediates your need for any type of owned transportation. Right? Because 
it, it has the automatic convenience of having your own motorcycle and yet none of the maintenance hassles of doing it. Hmm. It's really beautiful. And that 30 baht or 40 baht that you save every day turns into, you know, 500 baht pretty quickly. And now you can go out to dinner with your friends if you're a teenager. Mm-hmm. Right. So here's here's the way I here's the way I look at this. Right? I mean, there's a, there are a lot of things to talk about, but let's just back off for a second, and let me give you an example in my mind of what I think an average day would be like for an autonomous car. Let's say you own one, right? Let's say you're wealthy enough, or you just like driving. So on the weekends you want to go down to the beach or whatever, but during the week. You have a car that's, let's say, utilitarian. So it's not really expensive, but it's not really bad either, and it's brand new. But it's completely autonomous, and it's hooked up to all of the sort of ride-sharing um, companies that, are, that exist. So you wake up in the morning, and your car is not in your driveway, right? You're having breakfast, and when you're having breakfast, you just program your car using your cell phone or some device to come pick you up at, let's say, 6.45 in the morning. That's when you're going to be ready to leave. Let's say you commute to work by automobile. Your car comes and picks you up. It's been parked, by the way, in a remote area because real estate remotely is less expensive than it is. And there's no traffic on the road because most of the cars are not being used or people don't own. Everyone doesn't own a car. You get in your car at 645. Let's say it takes you 30 minutes to get get to work. When you when you get out of your car, your car doesn't have to park at your office because it's irrelevant for you. You get out of your car and you program the car of what types of rides, what time um, to accept those rides and what fares you're willing to accept during the day because you expect to leave work at six o'clock and you just program that into your car and your car essentially drives around whatever locale you've told it to do, right? And if it needs gas, it pulls into a gas station and gets gas. It's perfectly set up, by the way, for autonomous cars. That gas station knows what kind of car your car is Hmm. and what type of fuel to put into it. It also knows based on your license plate or some identifying factor how to charge you for it, which happens automatically the same way you you get out of an Uber today and you don't know what it costs necessarily, but it just automatically gets charged to your account. And no one's afraid of doing that, right? Nobody. Now, there may be some countries where it's cash only, but there are ways around that. right? So now your car is actually being used. It's making you money while you're at work, and it's offsetting the cost of that car, but it's also not taking up parking space in congested spaces in a city or even in a even in a town right and all day it's going around for people that either a don't want to have a car or b can't afford a car but need to go shopping or meet their friends or get from place to place for whatever reason and when that is over you have your car you summon your car either pre-programmed or if your day changes or if your daughter or son needs the car you stop it from taking new orders you send it to pick up your daughter from violin practice or whatever she's doing it takes her down to visit her friends or do her shopping she gets out you summon the car back to your office it travels on an untrafficked road comes and picks you up but then on your way home you live near people and maybe you work near people that live near you and those people ask you for a ride home and they're willing to offset some of the costs by paying for it even if it's minimal so now there are four people in a car as opposed to one people in a car. And if you look at the statistics, most cars in almost every city in the world have less than two people in it. Hmm. So Big it's problem. creating incredible efficiency, right? And incredible savings and it's good for pollution and it's good for traffic. But also you're earning money by having that car. And when you get home at night, let's say you go out to dinner that night. So you have your, your dinner partner join you. You can even go pick them up automatically. Hmm. They come join you while you're at dinner. Your car, again, either does some more work or maybe it just takes a break. You drink at dinner, right, because you enjoy wine or beer or cocktails. You don't want to drive drunk, but you don't have to. You get into your car. It takes you home. It drops off your dinner partner at their house. And then if it's done for the evening, let's say it's 10 o'clock at night. Well, now there's a bunch of people out in the city that are drinking and partying and doing whatever – but you send your car to a specific place that you like or a specific time frame. It picks people up. It drops people off. Everybody's safer. And then when it's really done for the night, maybe it needs gas. It goes automatically gets some gas. And then it goes to a remote area and parks. In a place where there's a 10-story parking garage, it parks itself automatically and then goes through the same process over again. That's only part of it. But that's what I think is going to happen. It reminds me a lot of our discussion about Airbnb in the sense that, you know, 
like with ownership of a car and Airbnb being, you know, owning a property, there's a lot of redundancy, isn't there? There's a lot of waste. So like if you have a spare bedroom, then you still have to pay tax on that spare bedroom for whatever reason. You still have to pay for the maintenance of it. And having a car that just kind of sits around and does nothing, you know, it costs you money, right? And so the Airbnb has managed to, to get all of this redundant inventory and people using it, right, and making money out of it. So they're sort of able to monetize what they have, this kind of asset. And right now, a car is, well, you know, it's not an asset. It's a liability, right? As soon as you buy it, it goes down in value. So there's a way that you can turn a car into an asset, right? And it can generate an income for you. So it's kind of like, I find that really fascinating. You know, any kind of business model where you can come in and you can, you know, allow people to you know, use up that, that redundant capacity within the whole market, right? And there's, a, there's a, a ton of that in the auto market, as there was in Airbnb, and Airbnb is chipping away at that and making money out of it. Absolutely. I just find that fascinating. Your, your scenario that you described, you know, that could be a way for somebody to say, well, okay, I'll buy an autonomous car. Maybe it's more expensive than your average car, but I can make this income on it. So it's kind of like creating a passive income for you, right? In a way right. that you would buy a, you know, a studio apartment or whatever and rent that out to, you know, professionals. Right. So then, and you just, you just hit on one of my favorite words and that is professionals and professionalization. So we talked last week and the week before about professionalization in the Airbnb market for business, for business travelers, right? And what does that mean? So, you know, the eBay model of starting with Pez and then moving into sort of higher level products and then real businesses taking over that whole process and using it as a marketplace and a platform for buying and selling things. So I see the same thing, the same possibility happening in the car market. So right now we have Uber, and Uber provides kind of a generalized service, both from a moving humans around and other types of logistics like delivering food. But maybe I have a different idea about how that service can take place. And let's say I live in a city and my idea is I want to buy 20 cars and I want them to be the top, top of the line. And I want them to be used for proms or for weddings or for special events and I can decorate them for you. I can do a whole bunch of sort of bespoke things for you. Now I'm professionalizing the autonomous car market and now I can charge more too because it's now a luxury product. You're never going to buy a stretch limo right today but you may take one to your prom or to your wedding. But in the same concept, I can now professionalize the use of an autonomous car or an autonomous ground vehicle and say – Use it for this special event. Rent it out for these things. And it's autonomous, so everybody can now enjoy it. You don't need a driver, and you can program it internally to do so many different things. And that, again, is another way to monetize, right? So this whole concept of and, – and there are ple- plenty of people worried that like automation and making things autonomous are going to make people lose their jobs. I, I think that that is going to happen to a certain extent, and we can talk about that again later. But I also believe that – some amount of human interaction or sort of human intervention is going to be really key at this point in the same way that we talked last week about the professionalization of the of the um, places for people to stay for business and for business travel. And the same thing is going to happen. You're going to see niche companies pop up where right. individual people, instead of buying 25 apartments and then renting them out on Airbnb or on Metro Spaces or places like that, that people are going to create their own versions of Uber that have their own specific niche. And I think people are going to be able to make money that way. And what does it mean? So where are they going to get the money for that? Well, it's another business line for a bank or for a lender to make money from that as well. And it's relatively straightforward to figure out the metrics around that too. So this is just another way to use crowdfunding and all of the technology that we talked about can create another entire ecosystem only because cars and ground vehicles have become autonomous. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, what, what are your th- thoughts on this, Michael. Is that what beyond the sort of these niche niches that you talk about, you know, how it's going to kind of disrupt the the status quo of city life? Because you know, you talk about the car being you know, pivotal to everything that we do in, in our daily lives, right? And, and mobility really is what we're talking about, right? So, for example, you know, people buy apartments in the center of the city and pay a premium for that because they don't have to commute right 
Exactly. And then, you know, you have parking lots, which are, you know, if I look at a parking lot and think, wow, that is just the most no-brainer business model in the world. Where you just buy it, you don't need people to operate this thing, you don't need to, you, you know, people who run parking lots, you don't have to worry about customer service and stuff like that, right? You know, it's just an easy model. Will we need parking lots anymore? You know, well, well that's the question. Them? So you have you have companies in Japan, Park Twenty Four, right? During the deepest part of the recession in Japan, a lot of these companies went out and bought land right in the center of Tokyo because they could not be used for buildings because the rents that they were earning were too low. Now it's different today, but companies like Park Twenty Four and Times Parking, all yeah. these companies came in and bought up land because the return, the yield that they could get by literally putting a non-staffed parking place there, yeah. completely automated. You came into the parking place got a ticket it probably took a picture of your license plate you parked and it raised up something behind your car so you could not pull out well, and even if you could get past that which maybe you could then you couldn't get out of the gate without paying right but the returns on those things were incredible and if you look at the stock performance i'm guessing from i don't know 2002 to 2007 the stock returns on some of those companies were great and remember they bought a lot of land too so there were ways for them to make money but Parking lots, I think, in an autonomous vehicle society, particularly downtown, are going to go away. Mm. Think about this, too. I want to go out to dinner with you or with a friend. We want to drive there, right? Ah, but I can't go to that one because I can't park there. Yeah, exactly. That doesn't exist anymore in, in an autonomous vehicle society because you just get out of your car, you walk away, and that car takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. But, think, but think about the implications of that, too. Let's say... You know, I want to buy some clothing or some shoes and I don't want to order them online because I want to go shopping with my friends and I want to do something social or even even the restaurant. And I say, oh, I want to go to this place, but there's no parking. I don't go. I I just don't go. So it's it stymies that part of economic activity. But also um, also it means that if I do go and I either illegally park. So now I get a now I get a now I get a ticket. um, it, It means as well that. It means as well that it's going to create a situation where I'm not going to do that thing, hmm. right? So in a in a world where there's an autonomous vehicle involved, I'm now going to be able to do that. And that means that now I can have a shop in a place where I might not have been able to have a shop because all of the things that prevented that shop from happening in the past are now gone. One Does that those, make sense? Yeah. One of those things as well could be just trying to find the place, right? So people yeah. put shops where – you know, they know there are going to be a foot full of customers, right? Because they know it's near the station, it's on the high street or whatever. But if you put something two rows back, people don't find it, right? And there's a huge difference. But now, well, the vehicle knows where to go, right? So it makes really no difference whether that shop is, you know, in a back street or, you know, right on the, the high street near the station, wherever, right? So those kind of that was going to affect land prices as well, right? And rental values. Right. I mean, imagine this too, right? If your car is completely automated, the likelihood that it has deeply embedded maps and location awareness is super high, right? Right. So, you know, that trip to grandma's house after she's moved to a new place, there are no arguments in the <laughs> car. Nobody, tell me you've never done this. Yeah. Um, you know, you go to a new restaurant, like you said, you're not arguing with your wife, but was it a left or a right? Is it on the far side? Like, oh, who's going to park? All these things go away. Yeah. You're laughing, but I really believe that that's true. You get in the car, you just program. Here's the address. Get me there. It seems and too sure. easy, though, right? That that's kind of my skeptical brain is think that just seems too easy, right? There's something we haven't seen here, which is going to make the whole thing difficult, right? I don't know. I, I don't know. Is we blindsided to something? It just seems too easy. It seems too good. It seems like it's going to solve too many problems. You know, and I think yeah, I that, mean. What, what could, this must be something wrong here. There must be something that we can't see. This autonomous cars are going to make the world a worse place because of X. We haven't seen what X is. Well, I mean, look. Once you create an autonomous car, what does that mean? It's got deeply embedded chips and software and all these other things in there, and some jerk is going to try to hack into it and just cause massive chaos, right? Mm. There are plenty of ways that this could go all wrong. But I'm a technology optimist and I'm like a human optimist as well. And sure, I think on the margin, some bad things can happen, but there are ways, you know, fool me once. Well, how does it, how does it go? You know, 
fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? So I like sure, the Bush that's... version better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, there was a Trump version out recently that was <laughs> better. I can't remember what it was. Um, and it was just like a complete non sequitur. But anyway, um, I think the reality is that all these systems can potentially be hacked. Airplanes can be hacked. Exactly. But, but they're not falling out of the sky. And the reason right. why is because – most people really, even if mo- – first of all, most hackers don't want to do that. Yeah. They just want attention really and I, we can argue about this for ages. Someone wants to do it but the likelihood of someone being smart enough and um, devious enough to actually do that and also angry enough, it's just – it's on the margin I think. Mm. And, and sure, things will go wrong in the same way that you know sometimes the airline systems jam up and the plane crashes. It yeah. does happen. Well, that's extremely no, that's rare compared to pilot error, right? I mean, you know, if they look at the stats, was it Malcolm Gladwell's outliers? He said that, you know, most crashes are caused by human error in, in planes, right? So the, the whole idea that, you know, a, an engine blows up or the, you know, the, the system goes down, it's like, it's so rare compared to the other options, right? So I, I guess it's the same with cars, isn't it? It's that. Yeah, I mean, st- statistically speaking, having a human not drive the car yeah. is way better than having a human drive the car. The computers don't get drunk, they don't get mad, they don't they don't get distracted. All of these things, I think, are benefits. There's there are drawbacks to everything, but I think in this case, the the benefits massively outweigh the drawbacks. Now, the question is, we you know, there are all these other ancillary benefits, and we've started to talk about some of them, and I feel like this is going to be a th- two or three part episode because there are plenty of other things that I'd like to discuss, but there will be negatives as well, right? I mean, if all cars could potentially be autonomous, what does a taxi driver do from now on, right? Truck drivers, the truck driving industry in the United States is one of the largest employers. So what happens And trucks will be first in the U S for sure, because mostly they're going straight, they're going fast and they're on highways. Yeah. Right. So we haven't touched at all upon the regulatory side of this, which we will do later. Um, and we haven't touched at all on, on the negative sides, as you said, about displacement. And I think that we can spend a lot of time talking about how automated things, I don't necessarily like the word robots per se, but how the automation of jobs will displace a whole host of workers. But think about it this way. Um, when the Industrial Revolution was taking place, nobody considered the social impact because, again, communication was just completely different back then. Mm-hmm. But nobody really considered the social impact of what's going to happen when we automate all these tasks and automate all these jobs. What's going to happen to people? What jobs are people going to have? But today we can actually – and I heard somebody else say this, right? So these are not my words, but I heard it and I liked it and I want to repeat it. So we can curate this change over time. We know that machines are going to come and automate a whole host of tasks. So let's think about what the social impact of that's going to be, whether it's automated cars, automated you know, cooking, automated food prep, automated deli- – all these things. We know it's going to happen because we can see it every day bit by bit. So I think we owe it to ourselves as social beings to try to figure out what's the best way to make sure that there's not some sort of apocalypse because – the jobs we have today are not necessarily the jobs we're going to have tomorrow. And I think autonomous cars figure into this greatly because they're such a large and integral part of society as it stands today. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen though, isn't it? There's no stopping it. I think we are now got quite a clear vision of where it's going in terms of the technology and availability. And we're seeing the, the big brands coming out now, the big auto manufacturers and all the, all the IT companies now getting in the act and staking their claims, right? Nailing their colors to the mast. So whether or not we want it is a different matter now to whether or not it's actually going to happen. You know, if we've got people like Ford coming out and say they're going to be, you know, uh, I, I've got an announcement here from Ford. I just have to dig it out, but something along the lines of being that, you know, they want to be a, fully autonomous by 20 21 21 there you go yeah so ford wants to ford wants to have level five autonomy so that's as you said earlier a fully self-driving car by 2021 exactly so there you, there you go so that i mean you know it's very clear that the willpower is there and i think it's going to happen now it's just you know there's a whole bunch of other factors that have to happen in different places and i guess this is a regional thing now what else needs to happen for fully autonomous vehicles to happen in your city, right? 
that's the kind of that's the next step because it's going to it's going to roll out at different speeds, isn't it? You know, you're going to have yeah, a whole bunch of other factors. And I, completely, and I think different regions, different cities, different places are going to have their own take on this, and. I, I think that it, it actually requires a much longer conversation to do that. I think it actually this may be the perfect place for us to pause because I really want to cover some of this stuff in our next episode as well. So yeah, if that's okay sure. with you. Yeah, we've got a whole bunch of other stuff on region by region analysis, right? We can walk sure, and we haven't, talked, we haven't talked at all about um, you know some of the key factors that's driving this thing, what's going to happen with all the data gets accumulated here, you know, what happens to labor and production and all these other things that are associated with it but i and i do want to cover them but i don't want to cover them any less in depth than we've already covered the things we've already discussed if that's okay with you yeah that's fantastic looking forward to it okay let's take a break from this topic and let's do our weekly segment on surprise that makes me the happiest that's a big surprise and to be fair i get a lot of feedback from this i have people that listen to the podcast a lot and they always say to me, they really look forward to the end when we talk about that's a big surprise. Mm. So let's talk about this a little bit. There was an article in Tech in Asia about um, what they were calling. So this company called Code Republic, which is an amalgamation of a few venture capitalist companies. And they want to be what they're calling the Y Combinator of Asia. Right. And I, you know, I was thinking about this today. I don't like when anybody wants to be the A of B or the, yeah. you know, X of Z. I, I don't, you know, no matter how much I love Porsche, I don't want to be like the Porsche of podcasters. I just want to be really good at having discussions. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the Porsche of anything, right? So now I don't want to be the Y Combinator of Asia. I, I just don't like that concept because it means you're just going to keep following and copying something that somebody else does. And we'll talk about this forever, but I just don't like that business model, right? Anyway, they had three companies that went through their 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 sort of process, and we can talk about all three of them, but I really want to focus on this one because I've done some math around it, and I don't get it. <laughs> hmm. It's and I won't be surprised if some of these companies that come out of the Y Combinator of Asia um, go away. So let's just talk about my my least favorite company here, and this is a company called Base Connect. So what does Base Connect do? Base Connect says there are four million SMEs in Japan. You live in Japan. I used to live there. You know what most of these companies are like. Um, and that they want to sort of aggregate all of the data that's associated with these these companies in Japan because they say something like 60% of these companies don't have enough data associated with them and they want to be able to create sales opportunities so you can know what the company does, who the key people are inside those companies and they want to sell this to people in what they're calling sales attacks. Did I get that right? Attack list, wasn't it? An yeah. attack list. This yeah. is such a classic – Japanese use of English yeah. language, no English speaker would ever use, but it's an attack list. It makes me nervous just talking about it. Please don't attack me. Anyway, um, so I was reading through this, and you know, I was doing some math, right? If there are 260 days in a normal year, that, that creates weekend days, about 105 weekend days. What they want to do is they want to have each search cost 25 cents. Hmm. Okay? So to get to... $32 million a year in revenue. I'm trying to get this company to be like a billion dollar company, right? So to do that, I figured you have a five times multiple, which is $200 million. And I'm just trying to figure out mathematically how many searches that would have to be a day. Right. What did you arrive at? Well, it's something like 3 million searches a day. Wow. At right? 25 cents a pop. Yeah, so if it's 3 million searches a day, it gets you to about $750,000 of revenue per weekday, right? That's at 25 cents a pub. That's $195 million a year in revenue, so it's a little bit more than 3 million. And that's out of, out of 4 million companies, they're expecting 75% of them to get at least one search a day. And I was trying to go through and try to find out how many B2B salespeople there were in Japan and how many people would want to create these attack lists. And to be fair... I couldn't find out, but just based on what I know about Japanese economic growth over the past 30 years, it's been essentially flat or close to zero. Mm. Based on what I know about what's been happening in the SME and SMB market in Japan, um, and based on the fact that it costs to, to get a Bloomberg, which probably has most of 
the data that most people would want for most relevant companies. I know that's only for listed companies, and a lot of these companies aren't going to be listed. But a lot of these companies, if there are four million of them, are going to have two to three people in them. They're not going to be worth targeting for attacks to be there. Yeah. Um, sorry for the sarcasm. Um, and what that means to me is that I don't think there are going to be three million searches a day. Mm-hmm. And even if there are five hundred thousand searches a day, you're talking about thirty-two million dollars of revenue a year and you know it's just if a bloomberg costs twenty thousand dollars a year you can have three people using it they can do a bunch of searches on there and then you get all these sort of embedded um financial data and financial analysis and global markets and all the other stuff that comes with a bloomberg i just don't know why somebody wouldn't just get a bloomberg right and the other thing too is most of these sm smes or smps as they're called in japan their staffing is probably not going to change Every three months or every or every day for sure. And what that means is that once you've kind of done a search on it, you have all the information. So it wouldn't surprise me if these companies went out of business pretty quickly because I'm not talking about the SMEs. I'm just talking about the data search around these companies, right? Mm-hmm. Because once you do a search on it and create your attack list, how many times a year are you going to do that? So again, this is my – I don't think it will be a big surprise if – this company and the money that gets invested in the winner of the Y Combinator of, or one of the three winners of the Y Combinator of Asia sort of competition. It's not a ton of money. I believe they only get $70,000, so it's not a lot. And it's not for a lot of equity either. I believe it's like somewhere between 5 and 7 maybe 7%. But it just feels like if you have $70,000 to burn or to give away, you know, I have, an, I have a bank account in Singapore that's readily available for depositing them. <laughs> well, what did you what did you think of their their ambition? They say that they're going to have all four million small, medium sized businesses in Japan covered in their database. Do you think that's a? I mean, I don't know what would be required to do that, but with seventy thousand dollars, it's not going to get you that, is it? It's not. But also, I, I think if you look at the age bracket of the owners or the proprietors of those four million businesses, I think you can discount the fact that most of them are not millennials. And if I look at the business owners that I know, and I don't generally like to generalize based on my own experience, but I think a lot of them are going to say things like, what? Mm. You know, I've been running this business for 40 years. My grandfather gave it to me, and I just don't have any reason to be able to give you this business. I went and actually looked at it. The other thing, too, is part of the problem with some of these Japanese businesses are that they don't look globally, they just look locally. And the local market has just been contracting for 30 years. And I'm just not sure that that's going to change. And I don't want to be bearish on Japan. I love Japan. I lived there for 20-something years. Like My entire adult life was spent in Japan. I have nothing but love, really. So it's not that at all. It's just that I would love the Y Combinator of Asia to encourage these companies to build their companies in another language, whether it's yeah. Chinese or English or French, I don't care what it is, but encourage them to build their companies in another language. So when I log on to this site, if I want to get an attack list for a company in Japan, but I'm not a Japanese company, I cannot find out who runs this company in Okayama. They may have 10 employees, but they may want to buy one of my widgets that I make in, you know, that I make in Central um, Europe, even if I'm a US-based company. Mm. That would be a great business. But the way it is right now, First of all, they'll never get 4 million businesses signed up. I, I don't think they'll get um, – what do they have now, 10,000 it said? Yeah, 10,000. I don't think in a year they'll have 50,000. And even if they do, it, it's not going to generate enough money, right? I mean even if there are 50,000 searches a day, right, mm. you still get, it's still revenue of $3 million a year. Now, maybe they have other products that they're going to offer. Maybe they're going to upsell people. Maybe it's a freemium business model where you have to pay for the charting. But if that's the case – I just don't see this as a domestic business only. A lot of those 4 million businesses, my guess, in 10 years will go away. So unless there's some other business model that's going to make money, 25 cents per search, per business, it's just maybe it happens you know, once a quarter. I just don't see it generating enough revenue to, to even be written up in the newspaper. I say the newspaper is a generic term for you know, the press. We don't read the newspaper anymore. We just read it online, but you know what I mean. And they're competing as well against Google. Which I seem, yeah. you know, I mean, my experience of working in sales organizations and with sales teams, right, is that a lot of the sales people would do their own prospecting, go and generate their own lists. And they're happy to, you know, you said, right, target this kind of company, go to Google and go and find them. They're happy to do that. that they see that as part of their job, 
right? Yeah, and they, look, they say they can do this 10 times faster. I'm a big believer in meta search, by the way, right? And, and we can talk about that again on a different episode. So I think there is a place for meta searches, meaning if I type in hamburger, I don't want to know how to make a hamburger. I just want to know where the hamburger shops are, right? So I like to eliminate all the noise that exists on Google and even on Facebook by doing meta searches, which I think are really um, important. But in this case, it's way too meta, yeah. <laughs> way too meta. And, and I don't think that there's a lot of noise around getting this data. Now, remember, it's, always, it's also impossible to get data on a lot of these non-public companies because they don't have any incentive to give it to you and they don't have any obligation to give it to you either. Hmm. Right? I mean, part of, part of getting listed on any part of any exchange is, is sort of the disclosure of data and information around your company, whether it's quarterly or semi-annually or annually. And these, these companies, these 4 million SMEs, if they're listed already, you can get the information on Bloomberg. If they're not, just the likelihood of them giving out information to you, which they haven't done maybe for two generations, I think is really unlikely. And that's what gets back to this. I don't think it'll be a big surprise if this company base connect unless they really change their um, their business model if it just goes away. There was a similar, I mean, we're going back, we're going back into print now, but there was a similar publication. I'm sure these exist for a lot of trade publications, a lot of verticals as well. I remember in the UK, there was one for the advertising industry. It was called ALF. I think it was a big, thick book. They published it every year, $500, I think it was. <laughs> right. And it had every ad agency, every media company, and every director in that company. And that's what you paid for. The problem is, is that, you know, after a month of getting the, the fresh book off the print, you know, you were the, the, the 500th guy to call that director. <laughs> <laughs> Are you fi- have you got Alf on your desk? Are you finding me because you've got that on your desk? And you know, so that's always a problem, isn't it? And you know, uh, by the end of the year, it goes out of date. So right, and the annoyance factor is just huge. Right. All right. right. So that's Base Connect. So yeah, Base Connect. And look, there are two other companies on there that we can talk about, but they have similar problems. Maybe we'll use them as that's a big surprise for next week. But I kind of like to do things that are more topical. I saw this on the news this week, and I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about it, but. I just don't think this company ever gets to scale or revenue that's that's worth, um, you know, investing in. To be fair, Do you think but again, a, I think, is there an inherent problem with the Japanese approach to startups that they they just kind of scared of going abroad? They're too domestically focused because that seems to be, I don't know, it seems to be something that I see a lot in these startups, right? You know, why are they focusing on the Japanese market only, right? You know, I know it's well, a big was, market, but it's a shrinking market, right? I mean, I was going to make the point that. If, you know, there, it brings up a, f- a few questions. One is, what's the, what's the validity or the strength of the people that are actually going through this, um, this program, right? Yeah. Because if that's the winner, what does it say about it? But second as well, what does it say about the overall state of the development of startup and seed stage companies in Japan if these are the three winners that um, Code Republic chooses to kind of go through their program? Right. So I think it does, it does beg that question as well. Does that back up to your earlier point about being the Y Combinator of Japan? That, <laughs> well, there's, a lot, there's a lot to do with that, isn't it? To being, being a knockoff rather than... Yeah, and remember, you know, one of the things that Y Combinator did, I believe, was create this whole tech stars universe, and that, that is global now. Um, and, and also remember Y Combinator is not based in, in Silicon Valley necessarily, so they look all over the country. But yeah, the model has been... It exists, but it also iterates all the time. And this is the biggest problem that I have with companies that are just copycats. And that is, you don't know what the next iteration is. So you're always looking backwards as opposed to looking forwards. And you're just trying to copy somebody else's model. Like, do something new. Japan's a different place. And there's no reason why it can't be better. But you've got to get over a bunch of hurdles, right? We talked about this before. Is it okay to go bankrupt? What happens to your reputation? Will you ever raise money again? Will your parents ever talk to you again? Yeah. Will you ever get a date again? Shame. If you fail this? Do you know what I mean? So in the U.S., it's almost like a badge of honor. I failed three times and then I succeeded. I don't yeah. know if you get a second chance or a third chance in Japan. Um, and I'm not confident that you do. But I don't think a model that sets you up for that and that publicizes that is necessarily very good in today's environment. Anyway, Agreed. that's why. Hey, just before we finish on that note, I want to ask you um, your thoughts. 20, 20 uh, graduates in the latest batch in – Code uh, Code Republic's batch just come mm-hmm. through. Of the twenty two, were women. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. Um, but I don't think that's a Japanese problem per se. I think that's a global problem. I mean, 
Uh, one of my contacts on LinkedIn today, and I was very happy about this actually, one of my contacts on LinkedIn today said they had a speaker who was male canceled, they wanted to replace him with a female, any recommendations? And there was just a deluge of people making recommendations for successful females in the startup world who could replace this person as a speaker. That it, it warms my heart really because I think people are starting to figure out that there's gotta be kind of like a groundswell of this. Yeah. You can create this regulation or that regulation, but I really think at some level you just need to shame people into doing the right thing by doing the right thing right in front of their face while they're doing something wrong. Yeah, I don't like the fact that there's two out of 22. I want society to encourage everybody to kind of have the same opportunity, really regardless of any categorization. You have a good idea? Do it. Just do it. Yeah, we can start with the difference between males and females, but it really it – really, um, drills down into every subcategory as far as I'm concerned. So I want everyone to have an opportunity to, to do big things. Yeah, right on. Cool. Well, really interesting this week. Autonomous vehicles more next week. Yep. Plenty more next week. If you have any follow-up or any questions for us, you can hashtag us Asia Tech Podcast. You can tweet me at, at Michael Waits. You can look for us on SoundCloud. You can look for us. Over there now. Excellent. On, on YouTube. You can look for us on our website. Please, um, please subscribe in any one of those places and definitely come back to feedback for us. I'm happy to answer, answer any questions. I'll even give out an email address. Just, just come back to me. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.